Welcome to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Here's your host, the Bitcoin Boomer himself, Gary Leland. And welcome to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I'm Gary Leland, your host, known as the Bitcoin Boomer, and that's why this is called the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Of course, boomers can watch this show, but anyone can watch this show. It's just called the Bitcoin Boomer Show because I'm the Bitcoin Boomer. So thanks for joining us on today's show. Today's show, we have British Hoddle. We're going to talk to him about Bitcoin ETFs and several things. And we have our great producer here, Stephanie. Stephanie, thanks for joining us again and handling the show. You're welcome. So, <laughs> Happy to be here. So you uh, talk to Hoddle. What do you think of Hoddle or our guest today? Well, Hoddle's pretty cool. Um, I had a question because I've seen Hoddle on multiple guests, Twitter handles and whatnot. Um, what does HODL mean in oh, Bitcoin? Yeah, because we see that word a lot, H-O-D-L. Yeah. Well, back when Bitcoin was around $800, the bottom, $800, isn't that nice to think you could have bought Bitcoin at $800 and now it's 42000 But back when Bitcoin was about $800, it was dropping, as it always does. It's a very volatile asset. And it was dropping maybe to $100. And it was a Bitcoin chat room, Bitcoin.com, I believe, or Bitcoin, wherever. Anyway, People were posting, oh, I'm selling my Bitcoin, I'm getting out of here. And someone who was sitting at their home drunk, or had a few drinks, let me rephrase it, said, someone asked him, are you going to sell your Bitcoin? And he goes, no, I'm going to hold it. And he misspelt it and said, H-O-D-L instead of H-O-L-D, HODL. And a lot of people say that holds on for dear life is what that means. But actually, it was a misspelling on the Bitcoin chat room. And it's pretty much just stuck. And to this day, that is the saying that Bitcoiners use. It's just hodl or hold your Bitcoin. If you hodl it long enough, you'll make money off of Bitcoin is the saying. But I do want to appreciate everybody, tell everybody I appreciate you coming to the show. We're going to have a great show today. And, and please, if you know anyone who's interested in Bitcoin or you think can learn something from our shows and would, would like to learn something from our shows, please share this show with them. I'm tell you right now, I don't have any Bitcoin to sell them. We're not trying to sell Bitcoin. We're just trying to educate Bitcoin, tell people about Bitcoin, have people learn about Bitcoin, because I truly believe Bitcoin is the asset of the future and everybody needs to have a little, but they need to know about it first. So please, if you know anyone who you think would be interested in learning about Bitcoin, do share this show with them. And I do want to thank our sponsor, Swan Bitcoin, for coming on the show today and sponsoring BitBlock Boom. And until then, we're going to say we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor with our guest for the day, British Hoddle. See you in a second. Grandpa, why do you have so much Bitcoin? Well, it all started in the year 2023 when I attended a conference called BitBlock Boom. What's BitBlock Boom, Grandpa? It was a conference where people talked about Bitcoin. This was way back when we used something called the U.S. dollar for money. What? Bitcoin wasn't always the world's money? If it weren't for great speakers at BitBlock Boom like Jimmy Song, Adam Curry, and Preston Pish, we'd all be living in pods and eating bugs. Instead, I was able to avoid fiat enslavement and secure generational wealth. F***ing legend. And welcome back to the show. I hope you're ready for some uh, good engagement today. We're going to be talking with British Hoddle from across the pond, as I think they call it. Hoddle, welcome to the show. Gary, my friend, thank you for having me. Thanks for your team for organizing this, and it's a pleasure to be here. Is that what you really say, across the pond? Or are you just making that up? I think I've heard that somewhere. You do say that. Okay. You do say it. <laughs> I just wanted yes, to make yes. sure that people in the uh, UK weren't going, what's that guy talking about across the pond? That's a big damn pond, though. Well, British, like I said, thanks for coming on the show. And before we get going, have a give everybody a short, um, just a short bio about yourself so they know who we're talking to here. Yeah, I'm an investor. I'm a traditional assets investor. I started my career in real estate. I uh, moved on to stocks and then gold. And then in 2020, up until 2020, I thought Bitcoin was a scam. And then in 2020, I realized how silly I was being for many, many years. Uh, and then I've now been applying everything that I've learned in traditional assets to Bitcoin and trying to now trying to help people understand and see it from the way a traditional assets investor is going to look at Bitcoin versus the way maybe that Bitcoiners who don't have experience with traditional assets have been looking at it. So that's why I started the YouTube. But uh, really, I'm just an investor like everyone else trying to protect the energy that I've earned 
and try and push it forward into the future. So whoever's carrying my last name um, can utilize that energy someday in the future. Well, you were uh, involved, though, with the media on Bitcoin before you started this YouTube channel. Because I remember back in 2021, maybe, I used to see you on Clubhouse a lot, um, I believe, if I'm correct. Yeah, I was on Clubhouse, but yeah. Yes, I was on Clubhouse. I didn't have anything else. No one knew who I was because at the time I was dealing with a couple of endings on business stuff that I was working on and uh, leaving uh, the United Kingdom and a bunch of different uh, personal stuff. So I, I didn't come out and show my face. I was just talking on Clubhouse as, as British Huddle. But um, that really changed in, uh, you know, about a year ago, I decided to put my face out there. And then five months ago, I started focusing on the YouTube. Well, I think your YouTube is, is definitely taken off. I see it in my feed all the time. It's funny, it doesn't matter whether I subscribe to something or not, whether I see it, it's just some way it gets in there. I can even subscribe to it and it doesn't increase it in my feed anymore. So I don't understand what the deal is on that, but your show's up quite a bit in my feed, so it must be a lot of people watching your show there. Uh, how'd you find out about Bitcoin? What made you, if you were in the gold and silver, what made you change your mind on that? Um, so, so I guess what was your yeah, orange I mean, pill I thought, moment? I thought, yeah, I thought Bitcoin was a scam. I just like anyone else who's been in this traditional analysis, but I thought Bitcoin was a scam because every single person who I respect said it was a scam. And then, uh, in 2020, when the, the, the worldwide flu season was happening, um, a friend of mine who I respect a lot said that he had started allocating to Bitcoin. And I said, are you crazy? And he said, we're not going to have a conversation about this until you re read or we we listen to books. So he said, until you listen to the Bitcoin standard by Saifedean Amos. And so one day I was walking around the park, uh, you know, and I was just listening to Saifedean's book. And then there's a point where he gets to the idea of stock to flow. And as a gold investor, you understand that the value of gold is really determined by its stock to flow. The value of any hard asset is determined by its stock to flow. And I'm not necessarily talking about plan B stock to flow price model. I'm just talking about the concept of stock to flow. If you want a hard asset, it has to have a high stock to flow ratio. And so, you know, as soon as he said the word stock to flow, it was like the matrix opened up for me. And I immediately understood that why I was getting Bitcoin wrong was that I was looking at it like an equity and I should have been looking at it like a commodity. Speaking of Plan B, I was going to ask you about that stock to flow. That's his deal, his stock to flow. That's what Plan B is known for, stock to flow. So what do you think of his stock to flow concept? I, I think Plan B, is he's known for, for formulating a price model around stock to flow. But the philosophy of stock to flow way outdates everyone right it's it's a normal thing that you know you look at in commodities and valuing hard assets what do i think of his price model i think it's interesting i think everyone should be allowed to express their opinions and have a thesis and an opinion um if i was to look at his very first you know everyone look everyone criticizes all of his changes of models but if i look at his very first model that he ever put out it's pretty accurate even for the last cycle so I, I wait to see what happens but again it's a thesis it's a model it's a prediction it's a, an opinion well in in your words Hado, what is bitcoin then you discovered it read that book it opened your eyes you stuck the flow what is bitcoin though to, to you know a lot of people are on the idea that bitcoin is a freedom technology and all this other stuff to me i don't come from that world my from from my perspective bitcoin is the premier store of value asset in the entire history of humanity. That's what Bitcoin is to me. That's what Bitcoin is to the people that I speak to. And that's what, and, and it also, in addition to that, has the potential ability to create freedom around the world for people to actually take possession of their own energy rather than having it uh, under the under the subjugate of someone else. And so I think Bitcoin is all of those things. But for me personally, it is the premier store of value in the entire world. Uh, I agree with that. I agree it's the rarest asset that's ever been. It's the rarest thing that's ever been. No more of it will ever be produced. I mean, and we all know gold goes up to $5,000 an ounce. They're going to find a buttload of gold that they couldn't get before. You know, same thing with oil and gas. The, the more expensive it is, the more of it's going to come out of the ground, basically, either way you go, which isn't going to happen to Bitcoin. Um, so that's what makes this different. One of the things I... 
also want to go over, because really, right now, we're in a pretty interesting time for Bitcoin um, with all the stuff that's going to happen this year. This is a busy year for Bitcoin. We got ETF, 11 of them, I believe it was, just went through. We got the happening coming up. Uh, this is the first year of the bull run, which traditionally we see three really strong years and one down year. What do you basically, before we get into the ETFs, because that's got more time, going to take up more time, I think, than we've got to talk here. But what, let's just say, basically, what do you think of Bitcoin this year? I'm not looking for a price, but what do you think of Bitcoin this year? Or do you think we're just going to see like in... When Bitcoin went up to 69,000, oh my gosh, I just saw it everywhere on TV. Everybody was talking about it. Is that what we're getting ready to see? Look, you said you want to talk about ETFs later, so I'll, I'll hold my comment on that. But just, just as far as Bitcoin goes, the first four-year cycle where we're starting to see uh, less Bitcoin on exchanges, right? It's the first four-year cycle where miners have started to figure out their capital structure. So they're not going to say make the same mistakes that they did in the last bull run. We're getting into the same, we're getting it. It's the first time that institutions can now market Bitcoin. It's the first time that CNBC is spending all day, every day talking about Bitcoin. They're laughing at Jamie Dimon, who is turning around and saying that he doesn't want to talk about Bitcoin because it's a piece of poo, right? So um, this, this is a monumental shift year for Bitcoin. It is going to penetrate consciousness like we've never, ever experienced before. Uh, and of course, all of the other coins that are out there in the world as well are losing steam, are losing attention. Why? Because you've got VCs that can't invest in them anymore. You've got uh, people that are going to get sued if they start promoting them. The SEC has demonstrated that. We've dealt with a regulatory environment right now, which is the biggest cleanup I've ever seen in my life. I said that Gary Gensler might be the MVP of Bitcoin for last year. And look what he's done. He's cleaned up FTX. He's cleaned up CZ. They've got the ETFs approved. It's it, there, So much has happened here when it comes to regulatory perception and, and the ability to market uh, a product. And, and that has to lead to a, an increase in consciousness around it. it it's, it's inevitable what's going on here. Now, the other night, I believe you were on our spaces when we had Eric. Well, I know you were on there when we had Eric on there, Eric Weiss. But uh, I don't know if you were on there when he said that actually – Gensler should be getting a lot more credit than he's been getting for what he's done for Bitcoin. I've been saying the same thing. I've been saying the same thing. For last year, if you go through my tweets, I said Gary Gensler might be the MVP of Bitcoin for 2023. And I, I completely agree. We've dealt with FTX, one of the biggest scam companies in the entire world. He's dealt with them efficiently. And, you know, They were trying to hide in the Bahamas. He's managed to bring all of that straight back to the U.S., Done, done with that, worked with all the different um, entities in the, you know, uh, enforcement agencies in the U.S. to make that happen. CZ has been quietened down. This is all great for Bitcoin. This is all healthy for Bitcoin. Well, we're going to go over some of that and get into some of those other questions I talked about right when we come back with word from our sponsors. So stay tuned. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome to the Bitcoin Conference Challenge. Today, we're teleporting Bitcoiners like you to two different Bitcoin conferences, and you'll get to experience them firsthand. Let's take you to Conference A. Hmm, it's okay. Some interesting speakers and workshops, but there's a foul odor in the air. What is that smell? Interesting. Now let's take you to Conference B. Wow, this one is amazing. The atmosphere is electric, the speakers are great, and the workshops are fantastic. Ah, and the smell. It's so nice to fill your lungs with freedom. Congratulations. You've just experienced the difference between a Bitcoin shitcoin conference and BitBlockBoom, the longest running Bitcoin only conference. Book your tickets today at BitBlockBoom.com and use the code BBB1 for a special discount. And welcome back to the show. Hey, I do want to mention before we bring back on our guests that if you know anyone that may be interested in learning about Bitcoin, finding out more about Bitcoin, share this show with them. I don't have any Bitcoin to sell them, but I will give them some information. And hopefully, that would be a good thing. Hoddle, welcome back to the show. Now, so you, you agree with Eric, though, that um, we should be giving praises out right now for the uh, job he's done instead of uh, everybody being all over yes. his ass because uh, he's cleaned up uh, everything. Yes. Uh, do you see a lot more house cleaning coming from Ginsor? 
I think it's pretty much done. I mean, like at this point, you know, the only next question is going to be interesting is whether the Ethereum ETF gets approved or not. I don't think it happens this year. I think there's going to be a long, long road as as BlackRock has highlighted for that. Um, and I think it will go through the same process. I, 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 I think this has been an amazing job that the U.S. Uh, regulatory agencies have done. And again, the U.S., everyone complains about them, but the U.S. regulatory agencies are overlooking the biggest best capital markets in the entire world. So they have to be careful, even if they sometimes forget to put two-factor authentication on their Twitter accounts. Yes, even if they forget that from time to time. That that was kind of an odd, odd thing. So uh we're talking about let's talk about ETFs now. Um I believe the first the gold ETF was the biggest ETF of its time for its first day at a billion dollars. And then Bitcoin comes in and does what, four, four and a half billion dollars? In his first day, if I'm if I've got my numbers down, am I correct on that? Yeah, it was. I think it was roughly around uh, the 1.5 to 3 billion dollar range. Um, but again, the volume for these nine Bitcoin ETFs that have been launched have been has been shockingly unbelievable. In the first trading day, the, in terms of the number of trades, they had doubled the number of trades than the S&P, the, than the SPY and the QQQ ETFs uh, combined, I believe. So, you know, a phenomenal amount of interest. Uh, and of course, you've got, you know, people blockading access to it like Vanguard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, th this has been a phenomenal launch of a new product. You know, most of these ETFs get less than $100 million in there in their first uh, trading year. And so this has been a phenomenal amount of volume. The interest is clearly there. A lot of bleeding has happened from GBTC, but again, the approval of an ETF now allows institutions to start promoting Bitcoin to clients and advertising Bitcoin into the world uh, under a regulatory framework, which is, which is phenomenal. This is the most important development for Bitcoin since Bitcoin itself uh you know was incepted as far as i'm concerned more people are going to own bitcoin now than than we could have ever dreamed because of the etf and they might even own it without knowing that they own it which is exactly what the situation is with bonds with equity certain equities uh with gold with everything else because you just tell your asset manager hey handle my money i want to go high risk i want to go low risk and they figure out how much to allocate yeah i noticed that uh we have some kathy and i have some of our funds in Ameriprise um, holding and we asked them, I just asked the other day, just out of curiosity, can we get into an ETF? You know, I'm fine holding my own Bitcoin, so I don't want to get into an ETF. And they said, we'll have to get back with you. And then a few days later, they got, after the weekend, they got back with me and they said, you can do it if you're in a self uh, where I do all my own stuff. You know, I don't know what the term is. Not for guidance with them, not where I get help from them. Self-direct, self-direct, self-direct. Yes, yes, that I could do it then, but not if I was wanting them to be advising me and helping me do it. Um, you know, and then you have uh, the other ones that aren't adding it. Um, what? Why do you think they are not adding the ETFs to these? And has that happened before, where ETFs come out, like when the gold ETF or the the other ones come out? Do they? Do that commonly, or is this very uh, uncommon? Every, I don't know that much about ETFs. Yeah, every, yeah, every every financial advisor is allowed to do what they want to do, and every financial advisor customer is also allowed to do what they want to do. So, for example, I had a friend call me and said, "Hey, you're not going to believe what the hell is happening here, but we're not allowed to execute trades on these Bitcoin ETFs because our shop won't allow us." Our compliance department won't allow us to execute. These are SEC regulated products, but the compliance department in his shop won't allow him to execute trades on it. So that's their prerogative. And it's also the prerogative of everyone who's watching. You can go and move your funds from Vanguard or whoever else that won't allow you to do it to Fidelity inside of 10 minutes and go and execute what you want to execute. The question is, do you understand the opportunity that's happening here? Do you understand the S curve of adoption that's going to happen here? And are you going to be there to take advantage of it? Or are you just going to wait to be at the effect of life? So these ETFs, and I know this is your big, your big thing is you're always knocking boomers, which is fine. You can knock boomers just like you can millennials. I'm not. I'm not. A anyone can be knocked. Gary, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> 
I knock doom and gloom boomers. Yes. Right. Okay. Most of my you mentors, do. most of the people I love, most of the people that have helped me in my life have been boomers. Right. I learn more from boomers than I learn from millennials. But the doom and gloom boomers specifically, I don't like I, I think that they are a drag on life. So, yes, any do boomer who's sitting there with a bad perspective and a negative perspective on life. I don't like, but all the other boomers that have got a great intention for their family, a great intention for the work that they're doing and the, and the, and the ethics around the work that they're doing. These are people that have helped me change my entire life so that I don't knock boomers. I knock doom and gloom boomers specifically. Well, I'm glad you gave me that uh, clarification there. Cause I felt like you were saying boomers, which all you are doom and boom gloomers. You know what I mean? I thought you were saying all boomers were doom. But uh, thanks for the clarification. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take some more. Res I'm gonna take some more responsibility in my content and clarify that more often. Well, that's okay. It didn't bother me. I mean, it's like it's kind of like when people say, "Oh yeah, boomer." Oh, I didn't mean to call you a boomer. I'm going. I look in the mirror every day. I know I'm old. I mean, you know, it didn't bother me at all. Some people get upset about that. I never. I never understood why. I think that's why I took the handle, the Bitcoin boomer, because I was confused why an old person would be upset if someone called him an old person. I mean, they've been called the baby boom <laughs> since they were were 10 years old they were the baby boomers so why all of a sudden do they get upset about that so uh back back on the etfs uh for a moment though getting off the boomers uh i don't even know why i got on the boomers there what do you th what do you think of etfs i'm just curious about about this situation and micro strategies because really i've always thought of micro strategies as like a bitcoin etf you know you couldn't get an etf uh, I bought it when it was like $160, you know, because it looked like I said, damn, that looks like an ETF to me. I'm going to get some of this. But do you think they will be affected? Micro strategies will be affected by the ETFs, companies like that? So on the 28th of December, I put out a video saying I'm not sure how relevant micro strategy is as a tier one solution. So to me, the way I look at it is like the ultimate tier one of owning Bitcoin is owning Bitcoin in self-custody. The closest thing to tier one, and which is also a tier one solution now is a spot Bitcoin ETF. Anything other than that, microstrategy, the mining stocks, options, whatever else you want to do is a tier two solution, which basically means it's got more risk uh, and it's not as good quality. And therefore you should adjust your portfolio allocation into that uh, accordingly. So what I said was, was that micro strategy is going to start struggling because it now has, it is no longer the de facto tier one solution that I had. Now there's actually a tier one solution, which is a spot Bitcoin ETF. And since that day to now, micro strategy is down 35% and Bitcoin was only down 2% since I put out that video. There was people out here and prominent Bitcoiners that you know, basically saying that, you know, Michael Saylor is running an absolute clinic on, you know, how to take the premium that MicroStrategy is running and turn it into more Bitcoin per share. I completely agree with that long term. I don't agree with that short term. And if MicroStrategy and its board are going to take my premium, the premium that I'm paying for the shares based on the amount of Bitcoin that they hold and convert it into Bitcoin, I should be the one doing that. So that's my philosophy on it. You can rely on them doing it, but I prefer me doing it. So I, I haven't owned MicroStrategy for a while. I think Michael Saylor is an absolute genius. I think it's going to be a one and done situation with the amount of treasury he put into the company uh, or the amount of treasury he put into Bitcoin. But I think he's an absolute genius. He's a titan in the space. Uh, but as a trade, I think MicroStrategy was, uh, was not looking good at the end of December. And that's when I put the video out. I said there's like a 35 to 40% premium to Bitcoin, and uh, that's what happened. The share price is down 35 to 40% since the launch of the ETFs. Well, I'm still up, luckily, <laughs> from, from the time I got in. That's all, that's all I know. Hey, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with HODL, British HODL, after this word from our sponsor. Please stay tuned. It's like it's like Mecca for Bitcoiners. Like everybody here is like part of the hardcore like inner sanctum. Um, you just have these conversations with everybody where like you can see it in their eyes that they believe the same things that you believe. You come to Bitblock Boom once, you're gonna come every year. And welcome back to the show. I'm your host Gary Leland, joined today by British Hoddle. Hoddle, let me. Before we go on, let me ask you a question about something you said a moment ago. So 
I understand what you're saying about micro strategies, and then you brought up the mining stocks also. I, b I guess you don't believe those are a good place to really put your money now if you have a choice between that and an ETF, Bitcoin ETF. Right, well, right now, if the way I allocate my portfolio, and again, I want to clarify, the way I allocate my portfolio comes with 18 to 19 years of investing experience. So it's not the way most people should do it. But for me, it's very simple. 50% has to be in the underlying macro investment, which in this case is Bitcoin. And then a smaller percentage can be in a tier, in a layer two solution. And then a smaller percentage than that can be in a layer three solution. So in that layer two solution, that includes uh, mining stocks, micro strategy, and whatever else might be out there. Um, and, and I will go and allocate at some point when I see that the value proposition is correct. Be a layer three. La layer three to me is derivatives. It's options. It's the highest risk. That's why it's the smallest allocation. The, the higher the risk, the smaller the allocation. Okay. And so uh, now get off that subject. How do you think Bitcoin, we, we had this conversation this morning before the show we started. I have a lot of people that come up to me and go, well, what are they going to do when Bitcoin takes over as the money? I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. I mean, I, I, I don't think I want it to happen anytime soon. Um, but what are your thoughts on that subject, Bitcoin becoming, taking over the U.S. dollar? Or, I, I don't the, think that's going to happen pound. in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen either. But yeah. it's funny, someone, very smart guy who's worth a lot of money just told me that this morning, you know. Yeah, I, you know, again, I can understand why people are saying that because they read uh, you know, the white paper and it says a peer to peer cash system. So that's the dream that they want. But, you know, I, I don't think realistically that's going to happen. Even when even when the U.S. dollar was backed by gold, it wasn't you weren't trading gold bricks. Right. You had a representation and it was 40 uh, percent backed uh, by gold. So, you know, that may come around at some point in the future, but I don't think that's anytime soon. There's a lot of other fiat currencies that have to that have to die before the US dollar dies. And I think you can kick this can down the road for at least another 30 to 50 years. Um, and so I don't need to worry about it. The main point is, the thing that I do need to worry about is a, a, accumulating enough of the underlying asset so that if it does become a significant asset, then I own enough of it, especially because of the scarcity of it, to for, for my position to mean something. And especially if you're a boomer, uh, which is what I'm assuming if you're watching the show, that's that's what you're attracted to. If you are a boomer, you know, like my parents, my parents worked were Im immigrants to the United Kingdom. They worked 35 years to build a property portfolio that they thought was doing the right thing, only to find that their properties have to be worth 50% more than they actually are because there wasn't a pound printed to a pound injected into the property market. And so their energy has been stolen from them for the two sons uh, that they were building for the two sons that they had. And they did the right thing. They followed the rules and did the right thing, and they still got screwed over. And that's where Bitcoin comes in, because no matter what happens, you cannot push and affect the supply lever of Bitcoin. There's two levers in an asset. There's a demand lever and a supply lever. The only thing that can move on Bitcoin is the demand lever. The supply lever is absolutely fixed, and ultimately, it goes to 21 million hard cap, and that's it. There's no one that can use implement regulation to increase the supply of Bitcoin. Not, none of that can happen. So. You know, if you're a boomer, you've got to start looking at the, the portfolio that you've got uh, and figuring out how to make a small allocation to Bitcoin and then start learning about it and maybe make a bigger allocation. Uh, my parents leveraged their property portfolio and they and they accumulated their Bitcoin. Granted, they had me as their son to bang it down there, you know, bang, bang their head against the wall every day until they got it. But if you're sitting there and you've got a legacy and you've got a future and you built something that you want to pass on to the people that are going to be carrying your last name. Bitcoin has to be part of your portfolio, in my opinion, at this point, even if it's a 1% allocation. And, and you, you'd be surprised how many people I speak to that have a $5 million property portfolio and are yet scared to make a $50,000 allocation to one Bitcoin at this point. So, so what do you say to that person that, you know... Um... Because I, I was thinking about that the other day. I've always told people put 1% in there. I mean, the odds of going a Bitcoin going to a million, I believe, are higher than going to zero. I mean, now, right. uh, I could be wrong. But uh, the average person, if you tell them to look at their portfolio and it's down 1%, they don't really get too upset. You know, like, oh, it's down 1%. Hopefully, it'll be back up tomorrow. Yet, they're scared to put that 1% into Bitcoin. 
uh, even though they wouldn't miss it in their portfolio. What do you say to that person? Yeah, Try, I mean, let's let's orange it's, pill it's, some it's boomers here. <laughs> Yeah, since since 2020, it's it, it's taken me no longer than 60 minutes to get somebody willing and excited to put one percent uh, into Bitcoin. And I I follow, you know, I, I'm going to do a video on this, but I, I basically follow three steps. Right, there's three stages to this that I've realized when I'm speaking to people. Number one is an introduction. They've got to be actually introduced to Bitcoin. They don't know what it is. They don't care what it is. They're driving their dream car. They're living their dream life. They've got the they've got the children. They've got the wife. They've got the the husband. They've got everything's good in their life. They don't care about it. They need to be introduced to it. Then once they've been introduced to it, they need to be educated on it. They need to understand what it actually is, what it means for them, not what I want it to mean, but what it means for them. Uh, and then once they've once they've educated on it, then they need to know, you know, what sort of allocation amount are we going to put to this? Uh, and that's generally around 1%. And now then you just explore the vehicles. The problem up until January 11th was that all the vehicles were complicated, right? You had to actually go buy, you know, get a Coinbase account or do this, that, and the other, and then allocate the money and then get a cold storage and this. Now you don't need to do that. You got, you know, $5 million worth of Tesla stock, go into your broker account, liquidate 50,000 of it and go buy the BlackRock fund. Done. Very, very simple. Okay, so let's go into your bracelet. How are you introducing him? What is an introduction? So, yeah, for me, you know, the an introduction is helping people understand what Bitcoin is. And somebody who's got a lot of money is, um, you know, what Bitcoin is, is, is another vehicle for them to protect that energy and for it to grow, right? So you have to explain that to them. Secondly, you got to build excitement. Most people don't know what's happened with these ETFs. Most people don't know that Bitcoin has a 21 million cap. Most people don't know these things. So you actually have to build the excitement for them and help them understand what this actually means. And then thirdly, as far as that introduction phase goes, is the latest developments of Bitcoin. The fact that Larry Fink is out here talking about Bitcoin. The fact that all these fidelities out here talking about Bitcoin. The fact that all these people have got their ETFs. The fact that regulatory section has been cleaned out. This is all the latest developments that people need to understand before they can feel safe. And then part number two is, is education. What do they, they need to build trust. They don't know anything about this. They know everything about property, right? Most people under the uh, threshold of $30 million uh, have most of their wealth in real estate. They know everything about property. So they trust property. So how do you build trust in Bitcoin, right? You need to figure that one out. Then you need to explain why it belongs in a portfolio, right? Because if they don't understand why it belongs in their property portfolio, they're never going to even look at it because they're focused down the track that they're focused on. And then you've got to look at the future potential of Bitcoin so they can get an understanding of why they need to actually spend more time being educated about it. And once you've got the education thing out of the way, then it's just about allocation. It's determining the percentage. I just start with 1%. If someone says, why not 5%, we we'll say, well, let's get you over 1% first, and then we can talk about 5%, right? Uh, and then you can explore the vehicles. So the way that I do that is very simple. You can buy the Bitcoin, you can uh, store the Bitcoin, you can leave it on the exchange, you can do self-custody, uh, you can use someone like Casa, like I do, to have a multi-sig, you can do all of that. Or now, it's very simple. We go into your broker account, we click buy, and you own Bitcoin because you've got the ETFs over there. Um, and at this point, you know, my that initial 1%, my intention is to guide people straight to the funds uh, because they get that allocation, then they can start learning about it and learning about self-custody and everything else. So I would just talk through the benefits of the, BlackRock fund or the Fidelity fund or whatever, and and just decide which one we're going to do, and 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 they'll go and do it. Like it's very simple. We're talking to people who have put their necks on the line to create some wealth, to to protect the family that they have, to protect the name that they have. They want to do this, right? But the problem is, no one in Bitcoin has been able to actually breach through that and actually speak to the person that's actually in there. Uh, and everyone's just talking about these, what I like to call happy hippie fairy tales about what Bitcoin can do in El Salvador. BlackRock, BlackRock's ETF accumulated 500, five times, 482% more Bitcoin than El Salvador did in its entire two years. Well, that's right? That was one day. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. So what are we going to see after a year? Where are we? Well, we got to go to a break now. So let's take this break and we'll go back into that when we get back with this word from our sponsor. Be right back.
And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Today we're talking with British Hoddle from, as uh, I said earlier, from across the pond. Hoddle, uh, um, my question is, what do you think the possibility of the amount of money, I'm asking this in a weird way, that could possibly go into ETFs by December 31st? I mean, if we're already up to billions of dollars, I mean, what would a whole year's worth of that? And, and a lot of people still haven't got in that want to get in. I mean, I know my brother-in-law wanted to get yeah. in to Bitcoin, but he didn't want to roll money out of his retirement fund and uh, to take it out and put it on an exchange and buy Bitcoin and pay the, uh, capital gains. So now he's going to buy some. I don't know yeah. if he's bought it already, but what do you see the possibility is? Yeah, I mean, so there's a difference between volume and in net inflow, right? So, you know, volume can go into the hundreds of billions because it's the total dollar values of the trade of the buyers and the sellers. But as far as I'm concerned, I said that I think we'll see $25 billion worth of net inflows. Now, I had a conversation with James from Bloomberg. Uh, he's, he's one of the main Bloomberg analysts alongside Eric, who's been fo following the ETFs. And he said 10. And then I had a conversation with him after the first couple of days of trading. And he said, I'd probably take the over on 10 and the under on 25. And, and I'm completely comfortable with that. So I think we see first year somewhere between 10 and $25 billion of net inflows. I lean more towards the 25 billion. Um, and that's absolutely phenomenal. That is, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of daily purchasing pressure that, that goes into the market. Uh, and eventually that's going to, you know, right now in the first few trading days, we're recording this on the 17th of January, you know, this is the fourth trading day for the ETFs. Uh, and there's a lot of sell pressure going on in the markets. Um, and so there's a lot of price volatility going on because of how the cash creates ETFs work. But um, that's going to stop at some point and people are going to start net buying. And at that point, you're going to start seeing the effects of supply and demand. That's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. It takes you back to basic maths, supply and demand. There is no there's no fugazi on the on the supply uh and and there's nothing else going on the demand side too. It's basics basics of supply and demand. But you would you would also agree getting off that subject now that if someone is capable of figuring out how to put their to just buy Bitcoin instead of an ETF, that's what they should do. Absolutely. The, the tier one, well, let me, let, me, let me hold back a little, little bit on that. The tier one absolute premier solution for anyone is buy Bitcoin, put it in self-custody. Now, if you are someone who has access to, uh, you know, to financial service providers. You uh, understand how markets work. You understand how leverage works. At that point, you now have to start looking at the Bitcoin ETFs because all of these companies that are out here trying to do Bitcoin lending are gonna have big competition from these ETFs because the rails are already there for the financial system. If I own $10 million of SPY stock, I can go and borrow money against that at basic, at almost Fed rates. Uh, and it takes two clicks of a button to do that from my, from within my broker account. And that's where Bitcoin is going. So the difference is, is while you be, might be paying 14% to borrow against your money with one of these Bitcoin-only venture-backed companies, you'll be able to go and do that at basically Fed rates um, through the ETF. So in that scenario, if you're comfortable with those sorts of things, the ETF can become very, very useful. Plus, if you want to, if you want Bitcoin to become a cash flow generating asset, the biggest thing that people are not paying attention to is, you know, the NYSE just filed uh, to apply for options trading on these ETFs. As soon as that happens within the next two or three months, you've now got income funds that can also invest in Bitcoin because they can just sell covered calls against uh, against that Bitcoin and generate you uh, a dividend income on a monthly basis. So this is the process of securitizing this asset. And it's happening beautifully. It's happening a lot slower than I thought it would, and the and the price predictions that I made uh, and the inflow predictions that I made, but it's happening, right? It might not. It might take a little bit longer, but definitely the uh, underlying data and the flow of capital is moving in the right direction here. What do you think of people who say I, I'm not? I don't care who it is that's saying it, but there are some people who say that the ETFs are going to enable the government to take all your Bitcoin. 
Yeah, listen, look, I think that's a really good way. And I'm surprised more of these uh, VC-backed Bitcoin-only companies are not saying that. Because if I was one of them, I'd be absolutely terrified about my business model being shredded to pieces. Because even if I'm out here selling Bitcoin for 1%, right? Let's say I sell $200 million worth of Bitcoin and I'm a VC-backed Bitcoin-only company. And I've got you know a 1% profit margin, right? That's $2 million. That's it. Right, I'm making two million dollars and selling two hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and these ETFs are coming in and basically saying you can buy and hold Bitcoin for 0.2 percent a year, right? And if you get in in the first five billion, it's 0.12 percent, right? So, you know, if I was them, that's exactly the fear mongering route that I would go down. It's the same thing that happened when I was in the gold space. When I entered the gold space, I was telling people like, why aren't you using GLD? And then selling covered calls against it, you can actually cash flow your gold rather than actually holding the physical gold and pay- paying the massive premiums that these gold uh, gold dealers are trying to get you to buy. If you buy a one gram bar of gold, you're paying a 40 to 60 percent premium versus me buying an ounce. So for me, the ETF and the covered calls was a better option. So if I was these Bitcoin only companies, I'd be out here at the top of my lungs talking about, oh, this, there's going to be a 6102 attack on your Bitcoin ETF. It's the only option they have to survive. That actually kind of makes sense. And I've never understood why the spot was so high on a gram of gold versus an ounce of gold. I mean, but uh, we're about to run out of time. Before we do that, though, please tell people where they can follow you, give them your info and stuff like that. Yeah. Listen, the first thing that you should do is follow Gary, right? Because Gary was one of the people that I followed when I was learning about Bitcoin and starting my Bitcoin journey. So follow Gary and attend the conference. Uh, But for me, if you want to get a hold of me, you go on YouTube, you type in British HODL uh, and you look for this face and you'll find me. Um, Or you go on Twitter, X, sorry, uh, and then type in at British HODL and you'll find me on there. Good enough. I do. I do want to tell you a story um, real quick about my trying to orange pill boomers hodl. You'll enjoy this. Uh, talking to a friend of mine, high wealth individual, and we're talking about Bitcoin. He wants. He asked me about it. I spent 15 minutes, 20 minutes, talking about Bitcoin. I think I've done a great job. I mean, you know, I've really gone, man, I'm telling this guy everything you want to know about Bitcoin. And when we get through with that 15 or 20 minutes of me going through it, he goes, well, do you have one on you? (laughs) I'm going, oh my gosh, I must have done the worst job of all times (laughs) explaining Bitcoin if I didn't even get covered that it wasn't a physical thing in my pocket. You know, Um, so for a while there, I used to carry one with me and, you know, one of those fake coins. So when someone asked me, I could pull it out and say, see this? And I go, oh my gosh, you got that $50,000 thing? I said, no, this is not a Bitcoin. So I could get that covered before I explained anything. So that was a, 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 a wow. my, my way of finding out I do a terrible job. I appreciate you saying the kind words on me, but I do a terrible job of explaining Bitcoin. That's okay. for sure. Well, I really, so humble. I really do appreciate you coming on the show. I've, we've had a, a great chat. Anything else you want to say before we get out of here? We got like a minute left. No, listen, look, the pleasure is all mine. I was, uh, you know, overwhelmed that you that you actually thought about me to invite me on your show. So I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you soon. And again, remember, if you're thinking about Bitcoin and you're thinking about all these other assets that you've got, the key thing is the only reason you invested in real estate, the only reason you invested in stocks, the only reason you invest in gold is scarcity. It's not the asset itself. It's about scarcity. And when you start understanding that scarcity is the true value, Bitcoin is the scarcest thing on the earth. Sounds good. So to put it into Hoddle's words, the three rules are buy Bitcoin, shut the F up, and get rich. Is that basically it? Get fabulously wealthy. Fabulously wealthy. Okay. I don't know what the difference is there, but I'll take either one of those. They both sound good to me. Hey, I appreciate it. British elegance. That's the oh, difference. Let's, see, that's, that's the English way, being elegant. Us Americans are just rude to the point. So uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming on the show. I've enjoyed chatting with you. We'll do this again sometime and have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. We'll be right back, everyone, after this word from our sponsor. Stay tuned. And 
welcome back to the show. I hope you've enjoyed our interview with British Hoddle and Stephanie, my great producer here. What was your input on this? What did you think of today's guest, Stephanie? Well, we talked about the ETFs um, a lot in this episode, and I know you answered my very basic question last time, but can you talk more about the ETFs and like how somebody could get involved with it? Sure, sure. An ETF is just an electronic traded fund. And so if you are someone who has stocks with Fidelity or BlackRock or, or anything like that, you have money with an advisor, you can now tell them to put your money into a Bitcoin ETF. So you can take your retirement funds, like, uh, for instance, the school retirement fund, the Arlington School District, could now buy Bitcoin through an ETF where, let's face it, Stephanie, they aren't going to buy Bitcoin, put it on a little thumb drive, and keep it in the safe at the headquarters of the school district. But now they can buy Bitcoin, thanks to the ETF. So uh, should cause a lot of money to go into Bitcoin. And as I said earlier, a lot of money, a lot of Bitcoin to come off the market being held by these ETFs. So I hope that answers your question. I do want to thank everybody here at Biz TV, including Stephanie, for the great job they're doing. I also want to tell you, take a look at my conference I do every year, BitBlock Boom. This is our seventh year for BitBlock Boom, scheduled for April and in Dallas, Texas. So do take a look at bitblockboom.com. Also, if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, check out our meetup. At, we have a meetup once a month normally where we talk about Bitcoin. Eat the barbecue, have a drink, talk about Bitcoin, go to meetup.com slash bitblockboom to find out more information on our meetups. Join the group and you'll be notified next time we have a meetup here. Check out the book I've written with some friends of mine, Bitcoin in the American Dream. Now, Hoddle mentioned uh, Saifedean Moose's book, The Bitcoin Standard, which is a great book, but this is also a good book for teaching someone about Bitcoin. Not as long and complicated as The Bitcoin Standard. This is about a two-hour read. You can read it on a flight. So if you know anyone interested in Bitcoin, please share the title of this book with them. I also want to tell you about satscardshop.com. Great way to give Bitcoin as a gift, stocking stuffer, Christmas gift, birthday gift, whatever. Check out satcardshop.com. I do want to thank you for coming on this, watching the show and joining us. Follow me on Twitter. I'm Gary Leland on Twitter. Follow me there. But thanks again for following us on the show today. We had a great conversation. We'll have a great conversation next week too. And until then, I want to say goodbye and stack those sats. Have a good one. Thank you.